you so much, Lydia, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm actually on Gadigal land at the moment. Uh, really appreciate everyone coming along, and I know that it's been a challenging time in the world of respiratory medicine, as you all know, trying to manage people with respiratory symptoms, and particularly trying to diagnose and manage people with um, COPD and, and asthma with access to things like spirometry. And Christine has told me that today is actually World COPD Day, so isn't that um, a nice day to be having this talk? So thank you so much um, and welcome. I'm sure you all know Christine really well, but I shall go through uh, your formal roles, um, even though everybody knows you very well. So obviously it's Professor, Professor Christine Jenkins. And Christine is head of respiratory group at the George Institute for Global Health. And she's a clinical professor at Concord Clinical School and the University of Sydney, and professor of respiratory medicine at the UNSW. Um, and having said just those, that's just the tip of the iceberg, because she's also a thoracic physician with a clinical and research focus on the management of airway disease. At the George Institute, she supervises a research group and PhD students implementing several trials on asthma, COPD, pulmonary rehabilitation in Australia, New Zealand and Asia. She's an active in advocacy and leadership for lung health in Australia and has previously chaired the National Asthma Campaign, the TSANZ, the National Asthma Reference Group, and has advised government on asthma as the national health priority, the Respiratory Conditions Advisory Group of the AIHW, and the Thoracic and Sleep Medicine Review of the um, MBS, also current chair of the Board of the Lung Foundation of Australia. I'm exhausted just, just um, reading it out, Christine. I'm so exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome, thank you so much. And just remember, questions in the Q&A and we will go through the questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Margot. And thank you everybody for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. I'm, I'm delighted to be giving it and uh, I hope that it's going to be uh, helpful for you. So can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Lovely. All right, so we might just go to the learning objectives, which uh, really crucially for this, uh, I am going to focus initially on COPD. And uh, the reason for that, of course, is because uh, it is World COPD Day, as Margot said, but also I think that it's a disease that impacts primary care very significantly and sometimes is not optimally managed, but things are moving quite fast in COPD and particularly with new therapies becoming available, I thought it was worth spending some time talking about that. So um, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, early detection, also about new patient groups for triple therapy, uh, understanding the value of pulmonary rehab and physical activity. And then I'll just at the end talk a little bit about the ways in which uh, COVID-19 has affected patients with airways disease and what we might expect in terms of um, consequences of SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, in this group of patients. So COPD in Australia uh, is actually a very prevalent disease. Um, it's also most prevalent in the lowest socioeconomic group in Australia, about one in 20 Australians uh, 45 years and over had COPD in 2017-18 and uh, the prevalence didn't differ significantly between men and women, now reflecting the fact that uh, women took up smoking 30 to 40 years ago and are now seriously suffering the consequences of that in terms of being equally likely to have COPD. Uh, COPD was the fifth leading cause of death in Australia in 2018 and it's the leading cause of preventable hospital admissions. It also has a major impact on patients' quality of life. And, and here you see some uh, uh, figures from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And what you can see is that the prevalence of COPD amongst people 45 years and over is uh, highest in the uh, lowest socioeconomic groups and uh, it is also related to some extent to remoteness and regionality in Australia. So patients in regional and remote Australia have a higher burden of COPD in terms of hospital admissions in particular. And patients with COPD in the bottom right-hand corner actually rate their, uh, their, their COPD as affecting their, lung, their quality of life as well as their lung function very substantially. 
And a much higher proportion of patients with COPD rank their quality of life as impaired, as being only fair or poor compared to people who do not have COPD. So I just want to talk now about the trajectory of COPD and the fact that uh, primary care is ideally suited to identifying these patients early. But it's really important that we understand now that, in fact, COPD is caused by many different phenomena and not just by uh, the, you know, the well-known established fact of tobacco smoking. Uh, people who are born early, so premature births, uh, low lung growth, uh, poor nutritional status in childhood, exposure to early life irritants, particularly uh, smoking parents, so smoking in the house and significant environmental tobacco smoke exposure, but also uh, adolescents and um, young adults who work in dusty jobs are all vulnerable to developing COPD. And particularly if they don't achieve optimal lung size, uh, by the time they're in their early 20s, COPD is more likely. So in this particular study, which was the Framingham cohort, they followed the trajectory of lung function in smokers and non-smokers. And really importantly, they showed that in males and females, there was a significant variability in the rate of decline of lung function, which we of course know. We know there are relatively fit smokers and we know that they don't appear to suffer the consequences of smoking as much as some others do. But really importantly, uh, females are much more likely to suffer COPD from a lower level of tobacco exposure. And the presence of respiratory symptoms at baseline um, is a really important clue to somebody who is going to be vulnerable to developing COPD. In this study, this baseline was actually in people in their 20s. So I'll go into some of the symptoms that do actually inform us about that risk, because I think, again, it's a great opportunity in primary care to identify these patients early. And this just shows the trajectory of these people. And what you can see here is the black lines, the top lines, are uh, uh, never smokers and not disadvantaged in early life. So these people reach the best lung function and then they have the lowest rate of decline, whether they are their it's their vital capacity or their FEV1. However, if they are adult smokers and maximally disadvantaged, you have the combination of not achieving optimal lung growth and you have accelerated lung function decline because you're exposed to tobacco smoke or other irritants that contribute to COPD. You can see this is the line. They don't reach optimal lung size in terms of FEV1 uh, or vital capacity, and they have a rapid decline. And that puts them in the ballpark of having COPD in their 50s and 60s, which is clearly not a, a desirable situation to be in. So we know from a number of studies that there are missed opportunities in primary care to identify these patients early. What's the merit of identifying them early? Well, of course, it is to sort of be able to weigh in in terms of minimising their exposure to whatever the aggravating factors are, whether it's smoking or their occupation. But importantly, in this study in the UK database, so this is a huge primary care database in the UK, they looked at diagnoses of COPD in this database of hundreds of thousands of patients and then tracked back to when they first presented with respiratory symptoms, required a chest X-ray, were cried an antibiotic for their chest or were referred to a chest specialist. And what they showed was that these were really opportunities for diagnosis. And yet the diagnosis was often not made until many years later. For instance, 85% of the patients uh, in the five years immediately prior to their diagnosis could have been diagnosed, 58% of them in the six to 10 years, 42% in the 11 to 15 years, and 8% in the 16 to 20 years. If you use those four criteria, prescription of an antibiotic for a lower respiratory infection, requirement for a chest X-ray, referral to a chest specialist, or identification of persistent lower respiratory symptoms post-infection. So these are things that you might be mindful of when you are 
when you see patients with those sorts of symptoms occurring in their 30s, perhaps, rather than in their 50s and 60s. And what you can see here is that this is for um, consultations for lower respiratory symptoms. And you see in the last uh, two to four years before diagnosis, these step up very markedly. So this is an opportunity in primary care or lower respiratory prescribing consultations. And these step up very quite gradually, but progressively over the prior 10 years. So if you're seeing a patient more often for their lower respiratory disease, think of this as a possibility. And the symptoms you'd be looking for particularly are mucus hypersecretion. This is a red flag for patients vulnerable to COPD, protracted lower respiratory tract symptoms, and exertional breathlessness, of course. But often that's manifest not as breathlessness. The patient doesn't come to you saying, I'm breathless. Early on, they just avoid activities that make them breathless. And they also have explanations of their own. I'm getting overweight. I'm not as active. I'm getting older. And so they're not going to say to you, I'm getting breathless on exertion. But they may well be avoiding exertion and strenuous activity that causes them to feel breathless. Later on, of course, it's the very classic things, exacerbations, prolonged recovery from infections, and obvious exertional dyspnea, excessive use of Ventolin, and even fatigue and mood changes. So I've really been talking about the progression of COPD from a silent phase to a more vivid phase, a more clinically active phase where you may make the diagnosis. But that silent phase is where I'm encouraging you to think, is this person likely to be at risk or developing COPD already? And we could look at this in terms of uh, the CT changes that occur. And so a normal CT progressing to one with cystic changes typical of emphysema. We could note a, a COPD uh, test, a COPD assessment test that actually progresses over time in terms of symptoms, or you might see more frequent exacerbations or lung function decline if you're mapping that. It certainly is occurring, and sadly it occurs rather silently when you're losing the first 30 to 40 or even 50% of your lung function, you don't know it except for these subtle adaptations. And I just want to remind you that uh, if you look at these figures, these four uh, tiles represent um, different aspects of symptom burden, either a six minute walk test here, uh, a modified uh, MRC dyspnea score, the number of exacerbations and the uh, quality of life. And importantly, these are mapped against FEV1. And I just want to point out here that you could have, for instance, an FEV1 of 40% predicted and you could have an exceptionally poor quality of life right up here with a very high score in your St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire or a very good one. So merely knowing what the patient's level of breathlessness is or their symptom burden is not going to inform you entirely about their lung function. They need to have their lung function performed so, so that you can know that. But you can assess their symptoms and you can do it objectively. And I'd encourage you to use this very simple score to do it. And then you can map it over time. But you can also map the progress of COPD patients very well using a COPD assessment test, the CAT. And the CAT is very simple, self-complete questionnaire. You can download it from the Lung Foundation website. Uh, and it's also open access. So you can Google it and get a CAT score uh, um, scoring uh, uh, system like this that enables you to ask the patient or the patient self-completes, that's by far the best way. They just put uh, a cross in the box. I never cough through to I cough all the time. I have no phlegm to my chest is completely full, etc. cetera. And, and this really informs you and allows you to add up their score out of 40. And as they progress, if you're doing something really effective for them, you should see that score go down. If they're not doing well, you'll see the score go up over time. And you can do this every six to 12 months and have an objective measure of how a COPD patient is progressing. But I just remind you that at the beginning, it's really essential to do spirometry. This might sound like, you know, uh, COPD 101, but sadly, a lot of COPD patients who I see cannot recall ever having had their lung function tested by spirometry. But really, you must do it to make the diagnosis. And sadly, I've also seen patients on COPD medications who don't have COPD. Um, so it's really vital. If you can't do it in your practice, um, then please refer the patient to a hospital laboratory to, to have it done. 
One of the challenges is differentiating asthma and COPD, and this is just a very simple uh, table that I use with students, but you know, you might find it helpful. And I think that one of the sort of really important things here is that to differentiate the sort between the sort of triggers that patients with asthma and COPD have typically triggers for COPD, breathlessness uh, related to exertion and activity, whereas typically in asthma, they may be related to activity, such as with exercise-induced asthma, but more often they're viral or allergic or nonspecific irritants. And another really important thing is that sputum is not a common feature of asthma. It may be there, but it's not the persistent sputum that a patient with uh, COPD has. And finally, and most importantly, the inhaled steroid response in asthma is impressive, but it's often very unimpressive, usually unimpressive in uh, COPD patients by comparison. There are merits for inhaled steroids, and I'll talk about them later, but you don't see the dramatic improvement that you do with, um, with an in an asthma patient. And an asthma patient will often respond with a very small dose of ICS in, in addition. Asthma patients, if they're well managed, will usually remain stable. COPD patients, unfortunately, usually slowly decline. So I guess I'm really encouraging you to think about the patient with mild COPD. You may not be noticing them. They may not be telling you they're still smoking. Um, you might feel because they've given up smoking, they're not at risk. Uh, I'd really encourage you to think about these patients. These are people with few symptoms. Um, they may not complain to you of breathlessness. Um, it may not appear that they're particularly impaired in terms of their daily activities, but they do have impaired lung function. And an FEV1 down around 60 to 80% after bronchodilator is a very significant abnormality. And, um, and it's time for this person to receive a, a really strategic approach in terms of their COPD. So what might that, that approach be? Well, first of all, um, I'd encourage you to look at the resources that are available to you on the Lung Foundation website. Um, there's a lot of information there for health professionals, and there's also a lot of information for patients. And if you don't have time to talk to patients about all the aspects of their COPD management, if they're uh, digitally savvy enough, they'll find resources here that will be immensely helpful to them. So what about pharmacotherapy for COPD? Where to begin? Well, it's, it's not an easy thing, but uh, first up is to start with a long-acting antimuscarinic. And the reason for that is that the evidence favours LAMAs over LABAs as a monotherapy bronchodilator. And you see that here in, in this uh, study comparing indicaterol to teotropium. And this is patients with exacerbations in this comparison and you see that teotropium reduces exacerbations more effectively than indicaterol does on average. It also slightly improves symptoms more effectively and, and quality of life. So um, it's really important to, to be able to initiate uh, a LAMA. And then when the patients are not doing optimally is when you introduce a LABA and the patient goes to dual bronchodilators. And this is just a systematic review showing you that uh, there is value in dual bronchodilators. In some patients, that value may not be particularly evident to you. On average, it can be quite small in some of the large randomized control trials in terms of lung function improvement, but it can be more significant in terms of uh, quality of life. And so I'd encourage you to weigh it up for your patients as you go. And if you don't think it's adding value, then there may be merit in going back to the monotherapy. But um, on average, patients do better on dual bronchodilators than on a monotherapy alone. Uh, when we come to thinking about dual therapies, it can be a LAMA LABA or a LABA ICS. Um, I would encourage you, if you're sure that the patient has COPD, always to use the LABA LAMA over the LABA ICS. And one of the reasons is that patients uh, with COPD who receive inhaled steroids are more likely to uh, develop lower respiratory tract infections. Now, um, if it's relatively mild disease, they won't have a lot of these, but nevertheless, there is roughly a 40 to 50% reduced chance of having uh, pneumonia if the patient is not on an ICS. 
Now, there are very good indications for ICS in, uh, in managing COPD, and I'll talk about those in a moment. And this is the COPDX uh, step up, stepwise plan for COPD. And what this says very clearly is that we should consider adding inhaled corticosteroids in patients with one or more severe exacerbation the previous year, that is a hospitalized exacerbation, or two or more non-hospitalized moderate exacerbations and significant symptoms despite LABA LAMA or ICS LABA. Um, and you can also add inhaled steroids in patients stabilized on a LABA um, LAMA and or an IC or with a LABA LAMA combination. So COPD exacerbations are hugely important, and as this slide shows, they actually uh, do contribute to deterioration in lung function and deterioration in uh, activities of daily living and in, in independence. So they have a major impact in that patients often don't recover back to where their lung function was previously. So preventing exacerbations is a key goal of, of COPD therapy. And what predicts that a patient's going to uh, have a COPD exacerbation or be at risk? Well, there are general predictors and they are worse FEV1, worse lung function, being a higher gold stage, increasing age, being more breathless and having lower physical activity levels as their baseline physical activity and having a lower body mass index, lower body mass index, below a healthy body mass index. There are personal history predictors and the strongest of those is a predisposition to exacerbations in the prior year. A hospital admission in the last 12 months, a history of reflux and eosinophilia peripheral eosinophilia, and I'll talk about that in more detail. And then there are near-term predictors that can help you know this person's about to exacerbate, what do I need to do to intervene now? And that is uh, recent deterioration in their activity level, having a viral infection in the last two weeks and having a raised white cell count, total white cell count. And then there are environmental predictors and season of the year is the most important. Having cold indoor temperatures uh, is another. And of course, being exposed to and suffering recurrent upper respiratory tract infections, viral especially. And this happens when COPD patients are particularly when they're exposed to their grandchildren. Um, if they are uh, not receiving influenza vaccinations, they are also more at risk. I'd encourage you for any patient with COPD, but particularly those who have had uh, a C an exacerbation to write them an action plan. And their action plan uh, should entail writing their usual medications, writing uh, what they should do if they're coughing more, have more phlegm, finding it harder to breathe. And then you can step them up in terms of adding in both bronchodilators and uh, oral steroids, and you can define the amount of prednisone they should take, when they should call you, and or whether they should take an antibiotic. Uh, you may prefer for them to come to see you, but of course that's not always possible, and it's not good to delay onset of treatment. So if you've got a patient prone to exacerbations, it's better to write them an action plan, give them a spare supply of oral steroid and, and an antibiotic, an appropriate antibiotic, Still ask them to come to see you as soon as they possibly can, but nevertheless give them the possibility of starting that therapy promptly when they become unwell. When should you introduce triple therapy? Well, COPDX says, as I've already um, suggested to you, in patients who have had recent exacerbations, particularly a hospitalised exacerbation, and triple therapy results in a lower rate of moderate or severe exacerbations, and is the most effective therapy in reducing the exacerbation rate overall. And indeed it is, but it results in a higher likelihood of pneumonia, and clearly that's counterproductive, in, in, particularly in some patients. Therefore, it should be limited to patients who are having exacerbations despite being optimally managed and where you know they're using their inhalers correctly and consistently. Uh, so in... In that instance, what do we know about the evidence? Well, we do know that uh, 
triple therapy uh, does reduce exacerbation rate compared to glycopuronium formoterol. In this study, the combination of glycopuronium formoterol and mametasone uh, reduced uh, exacerbations by uh, 16% and compared to budesonide formoterol reduced by 20%. So clearly the triple therapy here is superior to either the ICS larva or the larva lama. Uh, these reductions were also demonstrated in a similar study uh, quite markedly versus uh, glycopuronium formoterol and also uh, versus budesonide formoterol. And in another study, the impact study, uh, similarly, we see the effect of adding uh, a lama um, to a, an ICS larva, a 15% reduction, but the effect of adding an inhaled steroid here is a 25% reduction um, compared to uh, the dual bronchodilator, eumeclidinium volantarol in this instance. So, you know, I've told you some downsides to inhaled steroids and I've suggested they shouldn't be used until you've optimized the patient on the larva lama. But who benefits most of all is a critical question. And the, the COPD patient most likely to benefit from the addition of an inhaled steroid is an eosinophilic patient. And what you see here is if you cast your eyes across the horizontal axis, you see the level of peripheral eosinophilia in patients with eosinophils less than 2%, 2 to 4%, 4 to 6 and greater than 6 and now look up here, and what you're seeing here is the exacerbation reduction if the patient is on fluticasone as well as volantarol. So fluticasone here added to volantarol reduces exacerbations a little in patients who are minimally eosinophilic by more if they are more eosinophilic, 2 to 4%, by more if it's 4 to 6%, and if their peripheral eosinophils are greater than 6%, then they do markedly better with the addition of an inhaled steroid. So it is really important to uh, estimate the peripheral eosinophil count of patients with COPD to see whether or not they're really going to benefit from the addition of the inhaled steroid. And you see this just mapped out now for absolute counts of the eosinophils from uh, 50 to up to 600. And importantly, what you're seeing here is that all the inhaled steroid containing arms, so all of those that um, uh, contain um, uh, budesonide here, do much better than the arm that just contains the glycopuronium formoterol, particularly as the eosinophil counts increase. It doesn't seem to matter very much whether these confidence intervals are overlapping up to around an eosinophil count of 200. After that, the addition of the inhaled steroid will have a beneficial effect compared to the larva lama alone in terms of exacerbation reduction. And not only that, it also has a benefit in terms of mortality. So this, these are Kaplan-Meier curves, and what you're seeing here is this is the combination of uh, budesonide, formoterol, and um, glycopuronium with the lowest mortality rate in this one-year study uh, compared to the budesonide and, uh, and formoterol alone or compared to the uh, larva lama alone. So jumping now to comorbidities, COPD patients have a lot of comorbidities, and I'm sure you all are profoundly aware of this, but I just encourage you to treat those comorbidities. In a very nice study, not this one, but another one, the uh, Hunter uh, Newcastle group showed that we're very good at identifying comorbidities, but we're not great at treating them. So I just remind you how important that is. I also like to remind you how inactive COPD patients become and how important it is for them to uh, actually um, uh, receive uh, education and support in maintaining physical activity. And so this just shows you that compared to healthy subjects in terms of walking time, these were patients who had pedometers and um, uh, attached, so automatic measurements of their uh, physical activity in the day. 
And you can see for the increasing stages of their COPD, they become less and less active. Although even in mild disease, this inactivity is prominent. So that's what I mean by patients adjusting and reducing their activity levels, even when they're only mildly affected by their COPD. So what can be done for that? Advice about physical activity, how important it is to maintain it, how important it is to be on their feet, not to be sedentary, not to be sitting down all day. And I'd really encourage you to refer them to pulmonary rehabilitation. And, uh, and so I hope you all know the pulmonary rehab contact numbers for your uh, area. And, and I'd really encourage you, the patients are sometimes not keen in prospect, but they do do very well. They respond very well. It's not just exercise. They learn a lot about their COPD. They connect with other people who are similarly affected. They learn about breathing techniques. They learn about best management in terms of their action plans and their devices. So I'd really encourage you to, uh, to refer patients. So let's get to uh, uh, COVID-19 and how it's affected patients with respiratory disease. Well, there have been lots of good things happen as a result of COVID, dare I say it. I know that in primary care, you've been overwhelmed at times because of COVID. And, you know, I really respect the sort of ways in which you've had to pull out all the stops to, to uh, really adapt to the very rapid changes in the, in, in the, the community, community understanding and all the issues about um, interventions and changing modes of practice. So we do have new models of care. Some of them have been trialled and some of them modified, but people with respiratory disease especially have taken the public health messages very seriously. And I think you would have noticed that uh, many of them have avoided coming into the surgery. Uh, social distancing, hand hygiene and mask wearing have led to fewer COPD exacerbations. And I'll show you really convincing evidence for that. They've also led to fewer hospitalizations and deaths. And this is not just because our hospitals have been confronted by a big uh, necessity to, to, to pivot to COVID care. Um, this is the case around the world. It's not unique to us. And uh, it's a really important learning that when patients are not exposed to viral infection, they don't have exacerbations nearly as frequently. And they don't develop pneumonia nearly as frequently. So there are new opportunities for prevention. We need to embed these in the way we, we help patients to understand how to avoid having exacerbations. Telehealth has been fast-tracked and funding has been made available for it. And I know that, again, um, you've done a lot of telehealth in primary care. I know last year that was primarily through telephone calls and now there is a, a, a sort of structured um, reimbursement process for video um, calls rather than just for telephone calls. My personal view is that we still need a lot of information about telehealth and how useful it is. It was great for plugging the gaps, but is it the right model going forward? I personally think it is preferable to see your respiratory patients. Um, I know that a COPD patient can get themselves prepared in front of a screen and look pretty rested and, and not particularly distressed. And you could be lulled into thinking they're doing well. But if you walk out into the waiting room to call them in, you'll know how hard it is for them to get out of a chair sometimes, how slow they are, how breathless they are when they arrive in the consulting room, how long it takes them to recover. And that gives you just a huge amount of information you can't glean any other way. And then, of course, listening to their chest if they actually have an infection is a crucial thing. So um, whilst I know that telehealth has got its merits and great strengths, I, I think that we need to be wary of allowing it to supplant the way we see patients in, in the routine, in-person manner. So these are the figures that show you, give you the evidence. These, this is the impact of COVID-19 on respiratory deaths in Australia last year. So the brown line here is respiratory deaths in 2020 for the whole country. And uh, you can see how much this is below the five-year average and even below the variability typical of that five-year average. So we had um, really marked reduction. And you can see that happening from March when we locked down 
and when we started to institute all the behavioural changes that we've now embedded in pretty much normal life, social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, etc. So uh, COVID-19, social distancing and all those behaviours have, have helped definitely reduce our respiratory morbidity and mortality. And here you see it for emergency department pneumonia presentations in New South Wales. And again, this the red line is uh, 2021, the uh, grey line is 2020. And again, you can see uh, for um, uh, New South Wales, it was peaking up in 2021. And then we know we locked down late June. And here you go, you see it falling, falling, falling through our lockdown period uh, in most of New South Wales. So, um, you know, you can't ask for much better evidence than this that social behaviours can influence respiratory viral transmission and, and that transmission can influence pneumonia presentations and deaths. We also know it, it reduces transmission from lots of other respiratory infections. And here we have influenza A and B, adenovirus, respiratory syncytial virus kicking up madly since October when lockdowns were, uh, were released and, uh, and, and we were alive again. And so again, really good evidence that respiratory viruses hate a lockdown and, and love the freedom of, um, of people interacting. So uh, these phenomena have been seen around the world and this is the Spanish Outreach Service and um, the COPD patients in Spain did keep themselves at home and uh, over half of them reported not leaving home at all and 26% reported leaving home three or fewer times per week, a much reduced activity and interaction in the community. And they looked at pre and post lockdown outcomes and they showed a 62% decrease in the number of COPD exacerbations. The patients reported having better CAT scores overall, a 75% reduction in COPD related healthcare costs. Interestingly, though, the patients reported being more breathless. And you do wonder whether they again were more sedentary, they didn't, you know, do much physical activity, and that that, that was not good for them. Uh, this is smoking, looking at smoking. Now, smoking has been a big contentious issue in relation to COVID-19. Everybody expected that smokers would be more likely to both uh, acquire a SARS-CoV-2 infection and do very, very much worse. In fact, it's taken a long time for us to show that it is the case that smokers do worse, but they don't do nearly as badly as we might have expected. Smokers actually can have um, down-regulated ACE2 receptors, and that can mean that they may be less vulnerable. Uh, but this is the UK Biobank. This is a huge longitudinal cohort. And what they showed was that um, they, they looked at COVID-19 infections, positive PCRs, in, um, in this uh, cohort of 400,000 people. And then they looked at uh, hospitalizations and COVID-related deaths. And what they showed is compared with never smokers, there were higher likelihoods of hospitalization. The odds ratio is 1.8, so nearly twice as likely. Smokers were quite current smokers, were twice as likely to be hospitalized. And if they were light smokers, there's a strong uh, dose response here. So if they were one to nine cigarettes a day, their odds ratio of dying was 2.14 compared to non-smokers, 10 to 19, 5.9 times, and 20 plus a day, six times. So of course, there are a lot of confounders in here. Their smokers, current smokers are more likely to have cardiovascular disease. Uh, there may be a lot of other contributors, but even when they adjusted these ratios, they showed a strong propensity for worse outcomes in, in the smokers. And you see that here in, this is the, the fully adjusted model, and you see it for hospitalization, and you see the dose response here, and you can see that it's very significant in terms of death, particularly for uh, moderate 10 to 19 a day and 20 plus a day uh, smokers. Um, 
These analyses uh, also um, look at uh, how COPD patients might be more prone themselves, not just because they're smokers. In fact, in this study, this, uh, they controlled for smoking. So even when uh, COPD uh, patients are not smokers, they are at increased risk of worse outcomes if they get COVID-19. And this may be because a number of phenomena due to the pathology of COVID-19, of course, is likely to worsen an already damaged lung. So microthrombosis, small vessel thrombosis, intrapulmonary shunting that results from that. So as a result of having uh, ventilated but unperfused lung and secondary bacterial infection um, consequent on having COVID-19. But really importantly, uh, if the patients are taking inhaled steroids, they are less likely to have a bad outcome. So there's increasing evidence that inhaled steroids may be protective in both reducing uh, the severity of COVID-19 in patients who get it, and also the duration of uh, symptomatic illness. And um, you can see that in this next slide. Uh, so in a retrospective analysis of electronic health records in the UK, the Open Safety Study, they actually showed initially that COVID-19 mortality was increased in inhaled steroid users. But when they accounted for the fact that they had chronic lung disease, it was not increased at all. And so there was then a phase two study where they randomised patients to usual care or usual care plus budesonide. These were people who already had PCR positivity for SARS-CoV-2. And what they showed was that the time to self-reported recovery was shorter in the budesonide group and the inhaled budesonide administered in the early stages in particular reduced the need for medical care and hospitalisation. So there's now a large phase three study underway and this could be a real game changer, not just in terms of patients with airways disease, but also in terms of, of the whole, the broader community. So watch this space. Um, and here you see uh, the reduction in hospitalised exacerbations during COVID-19 in all sorts of different parts of the world, Germany, Korea, Norway, Portugal, Greece, Singapore, China, Spain, the UK. And um, what I just want to point out here is that, of course, these observations don't account for whether the patient was on inhaled steroids or not. But analyses that look at that suggest that the inhaled steroid is not the whole story, but uh, as I said, social distancing and all the behaviours that have protected patients against getting uh, viral infections generally, and COVID in particular, are important. Now, we undertook uh, a meta-analysis, uh, which was funded by Asthma Australia, to look at whether or not asthma patients were um, more likely to get COVID-19, be hospitalised with COVID-19, or die from COVID-19, because in the early days of the pandemic, patients with asthma were advised that they were more, more vulnerable and they should take the social distancing measures particularly seriously. What we showed, though, was that amongst patients with COVID-19, the prevalence of asthma was 6.77%, exactly the same, in fact, lower than in the general community. The risk of being infected with SARS-CoV-2 was similar in the asthma and non-asthma group. People with asthma had a significantly higher likelihood of ventilator use and being admitted to the ICU, which makes sense once they have the illness, but there were no significant differences in hospitalisation or mortality between the, the asthma groups and the non-asthma groups who were COVID positive. And we've subsequently updated this. In our initial review, we actually included people with suspected and proven COVID. And now we've done a, a really rigorous review with only PCR positive patients. And we have shown exactly the same, that there is no increased risk of getting COVID-19 if you have asthma, and there is no increased risk of dying from COVID-19 if you have asthma. So, you know, I think this is reassuring, but it also might go to the issue of the fact that inhaled steroids are playing some role in this. 
So uh, we actually demonstrated so far that patients with asthma are less likely to die from, from uh, COVID-19 compared to those without asthma. And, and we do think that there is probably a story for inhaled steroids in here, but we weren't able to discriminate in, in detail confidently in these big databases that we were doing the meta-analysis in. Um, the patients who were truly reliably taking inhaled steroids versus those who had just prescribed it. So we do think randomised control trials is, is really the only way to, uh, to answer this question. So um, this is my last slide, and, uh, and I would say that the impact of COVID-19 on respiratory disease management has had some positive outcomes, and I've just mentioned some of them. We've got new models of care. We can manage patients without them having to be physically in the practice, at least for a period of time. There may be cost efficiencies in that, but we need to be sure that there are also clinical care efficiencies. Um, people with respiratory disease have taken the public health messages very seriously, and we've seen that that has very positive outcomes. And we need to think about how that impacts on our care of these patients. And there are new formats and platforms, even for things like pulmonary rehab. Virtual pulmonary rehab is possible. And if you go on the Lung Foundation website, you'll see some evidence for that, and you'll see some, um, some very nice resources uh, for, for pulmonary rehab. So uh, these new opportunities, I think, include not just the social distancing and mask wearing and hand washing behaviours, but also the possibility that inhaled steroids are important in reducing the severity of COVID-19 illness. So, so this is something that we might see emerge in the future. It's entirely plausible. It fits with the fact that COVID-19 is an inflammatory condition. It also fits with the fact that patients who take inhaled steroids have down-regulated ACE2 receptors. And so again, they may be less likely to develop the disease or for the virus to become invasive. So um, with that, I think um, I'll hand back to you, Margot, and uh, I'll stop talking. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm just got my camera on. Thank you so much. That was uh, a really very um, comprehensive overlook of COPD. And I, I particularly like your positive um, comments about some of the, the things that the good things have come from the pandemic, which I would totally agree. There's, uh, you know, even just access to having telehealth has been uh, great yet, but how do we use it? So thank you so much for that. Um, we've actually, um, so far, we need a few more questions in our Q&A, but I'm going to kick off with the first one, which is, why is it that only approximately 25% of smokers actually develop deterioration in lung function? I guess what protects the rest of them, I suppose? I don't think we know this entirely yet. If only we did, um, what protects the rest of them is, is exactly the right question to ask. And I think some of the, the issue here is that we focus particularly on tobacco-related disease in Western countries in particular. And now we know, we know from low-income countries, other noxious inhaled substances, smokes, dusts, and fumes are really important in increasing the probability of lung damage, airway damage that results in COPD. And we know that women in low-income countries who are exposed to biomass fuel uh, in poorly ventilated um, housing are equally likely to develop COPD as is a tobacco smoker in a, in a similar country. So, and I think we're learning things like, you know, poor nutrition in early life, recurrent respiratory infections in early life um, are all important contributors, environmental tobacco smoke in early life. So it may be that people are variably sensitive to different one different of these triggers, you know, and some people will develop their COPD to tobacco. But why do some people who smoke never develop COPD, but they do get coronary artery disease or they do get peripheral mm. um, uh, arterial disease or lung cancer? Mm. You know, we've really got a long way to go in sorting out these uh, propensities and, and predispositions. But this is why... I think it's important that everybody you see who has the symptoms, these early symptoms, it's really important to think because we don't have the biomarkers, we can't say, oh, for sure, you're, you're not going to get COPD mm -hmm. um, and you are. We've got to treat every patient who could be at risk as somebody who, who we need to assess fully and, and make the diagnosis properly. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Christine. I'm just interested in the um, all our social distancing and, and uh, those sorts of measures that have prevented so many respiratory infections. What's likely to happen if we let down our guard next year? Is it going to be a really bad flu season next year or what would you predict? I think it, it's really, there's quite a bit of crystal ball gazing here, mm. but but we do know that virus, well, you've, you've seen those data for uh, extraordinary um, uh, low levels, virtually no influenza. Mm. So we do expect that we will see the influenza viruses reappear as important pathogens in winter. And um, as the coronavirus becomes more inhibited and less readily transmitted in the community because of vaccination and because of the, the changes in social behaviours, the, the other respiratory viruses will reappear. And I showed that kick up with RSV mm. and, and you mentioned that your granddaughter had been mm. affected. And, and, you know, I know the paediatricians are seeing a big increase in, in RSV presentations in hospitals now. And so, you know, I, the viruses are all struggling with each other for supremacy. <laughs> and so we will definitely see um, influenza reappear and we need to be vigilant about flu vaccinations as well. And, and I think um, influenza can also be reduced by some of these behaviours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we should encourage patients to, who are at risk to, to be careful in winter in particular. Absolutely. Um, I've got another question. How do we manage the patient with persistent symptoms such as cough or shortness of breath in the weeks after contracting COVID when they're considered no longer infectious? I guess it's the big question is that all of the post-COVID conditions that we're not quite sure what's ahead for yeah. us. Well, I, I haven't talked about that, but I, I think what I'd say is um, in communities where there's been a very high level of COVID infection, um, you know, for instance, in India, although um, they had uh, something like only, uh, well, they had a huge number of COVID deaths, of course, but although uh, only 5 to 10% of the population in Delhi had had symptomatic illness with COVID-19 in the peak, by the peak of their third wave, 90% of Delhi residents had uh, antibodies to COVID-19. So, and that was pre-vaccination. So, um, you know, we know a lot of people are acquiring it asymptomatically. But if you are thinking about long COVID, it, in general, it appears to relate to more severe disease. So people are more likely to get it if they've had more severe disease, if they've been hospitalised for COVID. But that doesn't mean to say that people who had mild disease won't get it. Uh, so it's really important that um, we, we suspect it in anybody. Prolonged fatigue, fatigability uh, and um, uh, breathlessness are the commonest symptoms. Breathlessness can be very hard to sort of uh, discern and, and differentiate from fatigability. And so um, it's important, I think, to do lung function. A lot of these patients will still have persistent uh, CT changes, mild changes, ground glass changes. Others of them will have mild lung function abnormalities, particularly an abnormal diffusing capacity. Uh, they're very rarely uh, hypoxemic, so it's not usual that they're persistently hypoxemic. But in the studies of the patients uh, who were hospitalised in Wuhan and in Italy, in the first wave of, of COVID, the, the alpha variant, um, what we saw was that uh, patients who had severe disease warranting a hospitalisation were much more likely to have persistent abnormalities out to around three months. After that, um, if there is persisting abnormality in the CT or the lung function, um, then the patient really must be fully assessed. Now, we don't yet have a treatment for long COVID. So, you know, the important thing is that there's a number of trials underway looking at anti-inflammatories, looking at um, broad-based anti-inflammatories like colchicine, low-dose steroids, etc. But we really don't yet know what the definitive treatment is. However, helping those patients to get back to reasonable condition and managing their anxiety there's often a lot of uh, 
tiredness and anxiety are very closely linked and um, helping them to appreciate that they are likely to finally recover post-viral syndromes as we know it. They exist after influenza. We've seen them after many respiratory viruses. But um, I, I think it's important that if a patient is persistently symptomatic, particularly with breathlessness on exertion, um, around two to three months post-infection, post they, they should be fully investigated and referred for full investigations. Mm, thanks, Green. I've just turned off my camera because I was dropping in and out there. So mm. I think it hopefully a bit more stable. So sorry about that. Yeah, so I guess you're right. There's there's so much ahead. And I guess that sort of leads to that question of pulmonary rehab, because of course, so many of the, th the services have actually been not accessible. I mean, I think a lot of my patients have really lost condition not actually having access to things. Yeah. So I guess we can only hope that um, some of those things will start opening up again. So people can get um, back some of their fitness as well. And they are opening up again. And in fact, there are some quite nice models for running pulmonary rehab um, in a socially distanced way. You can't take as many patients, but I think it's really important that they do open up and that the physical facilities become available again. There is virtual pulmonary rehab. There are a number of um, programs and the, um, the pulmonary rehab uh, physios that are part of the Lung Foundation uh, Pulmonary Rehab Network, they have devised some very good virtual um, uh, pulmonary rehab patients can do at home. But really, there's nothing that replaces the interaction and the real life experience of being there with a, you know, on a treadmill, on a working walking circuit, on a bike, etc., with mm. supervision. And, and so, I totally agree with you. Getting them back to that as soon as possible is important. Nice. But we just wanted to quickly mention um, health pathways because there's been an incredible amount of work being done in that area um, around, particularly around COVID. I mean, there's obviously some great pathways there on uh, COPD, respiratory illnesses, including access to things like uh, respiratory rehab. But tonight, I just wanted to um, mention a lot of the work that's gone into uh, the COVID pathways. And the one we wanted to particularly um, show you tonight was around the COVID COVID, um, post-COVID conditions. Um, and I'm hoping that most of you already know what I'm talking about with health pathways. And if you're in um, Sydney, the Sydney Health Pathways area, of course, our um, username is uh, connected and our password is healthcare. If you are not inside um, this, this South, um, if you're in the Southeast Sydney or a different area, um, if you contact the CPD team, I'm sure they'll be able to um, let you know uh, the passwords. I'm not sure if I can share my screen. I can give it a go. Well, I just see if I can actually just show you some of those ones um, oh, that I think well, I'm sharing now, so that looks good. So that's the Sydney um, Community Health Pathways. The, and, the, and I said there is a Southeast Sydney as well. If you can see up in the home here, we've got the COVID section. If I open that, these are all the COVID pathways that we have. And the specific ones for tonight, if we're looking about post-COVID conditions, they're in assessment and management pathways and inside our case management. So it's deep down. Um, this is our um, how to look after the cases of COVID and then the post-COVID um, conditions. Oh, sorry. Uh, there it is, the post-COVID conditions. So it does talk about a lot of those things about how to manage um, breathlessness and some of the guidelines that we have, for well, not guidelines, but some of the things that we might be able to offer our patients with post-COVID at the moment. Um, but I'm, I'm sure they will get developed, as Christine said, as we will learn more as we go forward. So any other questions before we all get an early mark tonight? Um, there are no questions, but there are quite nice comments and um, uh, thank you. All right, everyone. Um, good night. Have an early night and thank you for attending. I hope it's been useful.